know if you noticed in the lessons this morning, both from the epistle of First John, John's first epistle, and John's gospel, there's a whole lot of abiding going on. It's one of those words that we tend to use in church and not many other places anymore. Unless you say it's sort of the negative. I cannot abide you, or I cannot abide this situation anymore, meaning I can't put up with this any longer. Words do change in meaning through the years, don't they? Now, don't say to anybody, let's hook up and have lunch this week, because that means something totally different than it used to mean when you wanted to say, let's get together and have a meal. If you don't know what it means, ask your grandchildren. They'll explain it to you. There's also a word that's very much like abide that's called cleave. And if I say cleave, what do you think of? Think of the tool, the cleaver? Yep, the chopper. How many of you have a cleaver at your house? To cleave means to separate, to whack in two, to hack up. But I'll bet if those of you who are married, anybody here married more than 50 years? Lots of you have been married more than 50 years. Did any of you say, after the pastor asked you, did you say, I will, when it said, wilt thou cleave thee only unto her as long as ye both shall live? Anybody use that language? Nope? Well, then you're younger than I thought you are. Good for you. Um, to abide, if you looked at the little toaster lesson that we had this morning for the kids, means to remain or to stay close to something. And to cleave to is to stay very close to something or to stick closely to something. It means about the same thing. There aren't many, though, um, synonyms for abide or cleave that mean the same things that it meant in the scriptural passage we just read today. Abide means to continue to be in a place for a significant amount of time. That's one definition of it. To dwell, as in to have an abode, which is a home. To make your abode with something is to abide with something. To hang around, to remain, to stay, or to stick around. Jesus is saying to his disciples, then, if you stick around with me, things are going to be okay. Now, if you've ever seen grapevine, or if you've had grapevine, wild grapevine at your house, you know it can go crazy. It takes a lot of control to get it pruned back. Jesus knew that the people in his time and in his culture understood grapevines very well because every town had a vineyard because they had to drink wine. Now, don't, please don't tell me they drank grape juice in the scriptures because that would have turned to mold right away. It was fermented grape juice, because when you're living in such a desert clime anyway, it's going to be wine whether you want it to be or not. So wine was something that everyone knew, and they knew about the grapes. Anybody ever traveled to grape-growing country? I used to go to New York every fall to tour wineries. Just tour them, right? Right, right, just tour them. Maybe a little sample now and then. But it's amazing when you see how far back they can be pruned at the end of the growing season. You would think nothing would ever grow again. And Jesus uses this example that everyone would have been able to just immediately see in their minds as soon as he said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Now, we have entered in the season of Easter into a strange part of scripture in John. We are in what is called John's final discourse, Jesus and his last moments with the disciples. Jesus has said to them, I am the vine and you are the branches, before he is going to die. He wants them to get this image. Now, if you're familiar at all with John's Gospel, and I've talked a little bit about the, the differences between the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means things pretty much happen as a story. John is writing theology from the beginning. Because what does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a Christology. It's saying that Christ, who is born into Bethlehem as Jesus, is God himself made flesh. It's very much about the incarnation. And where do you hear those words in the beginning? Here, I'm at the beginning of Scripture, Genesis. And then if you go to Exodus, when Moses is standing in front of the burning bush and God says to Moses through this burning bush, I want you to go to the Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and... Moses has the audacity to say, um, whom shall I say is sending me? And God gives the name Yahweh, I am. That ought to put you in your place, don't you think? Who are, who are you? I am. And I will be who I will be, are the translations of Yahweh from scripture. 
a name so holy that Jews don't even say it anymore. And now the Roman Catholic Church has followed suit. It will not use the words Yahweh anymore, I am, as the title for God. But Jesus, in John's Gospel, not only goes back to the beginning with John, but Jesus says a lot of I am. Here's your test. Now, if you're over here and you're live, you can call it out. If you're at home, you're off the hook. Jesus said, I am what? David said one last week. I watched it. I listened. I am the good shepherd. I heard somebody yell out. Jesus said, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the living water. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. I am, I am, I am. This is the last I am saying in John's Gospel before Jesus is arrested and crucified. He says this after dinner with his disciples before he prays for them in the garden. He says to them, I am the vine and you are the branches. If he is saying this to them at the end of his life, at the end of his earthly ministry, at the end of their time together, you know this is important. How many of you, when you were leaving your kids alone for the first time, said to them, now when I leave, you're supposed to do what? Lock the door. Not open it for anybody. Have the phone ready. Answer the phone if I call you. You give them the list of things that are the most important things to do for their safety and their well-being in your absence. And Jesus is saying things to them they don't understand at this point. He's saying to them, now, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. You won't be alone. I'm leaving you, but someone is coming. Someone, because the Holy Spirit is not an it, it's not a thing, it's a person. The Holy Spirit is going to come with you, come alongside you. The Holy Spirit will be with you in my absence. And they have no idea what he's talking about. But he says to them, I'm the vine and you're the branches, and my Father is the vine tender. My Father is the one who will create the growth. Now, I didn't know if our kids knew a lot about vineyards and wine growing for grapes. Grape growing for wine. I got that one backwards, didn't I? Growing grapes to make wine and how, how you have to cut them back every year so they continue to produce fruit. Now, how many of you were threatened with the passage as a kid? If you don't do what God wants, God's going to cut you off and throw you in the fire. That is apparently not what the message here is. It's not a message of judgment, just the reality that if you're cut off from Jesus Christ as his disciple, there is just nothing left for you because you're not going to be able to grow, you're not going to be able to produce fruit, you're not going to be able to continue to spread the gospel to others. And we talked a little bit with the kids about how to abide in God's love, by reading the scripture, by praying for others, by being helpful. But John says it very clearly in both his gospel and in his epistle that the way to do it is to abide in the love of God. Yesterday some of us gathered on Zoom to celebrate the life of Ed Fischel. A little bit later than we hoped, because we hoped we'd be together again. We hoped we'd be able to be at their farm so we could be there for the interment of his ashes. We hoped we could be together to celebrate his life. But we were gathered around the country. One son in Atlanta, one son in Oregon, Barb out in Oregon with her son and daughter-in-law. Many of us here, Dottie and Gary Johansson, if you're watching this morning, hey, hey, Johansons. We're glad, we were glad to see you yesterday. They're in Florida. So we gathered and we celebrated his life. I never got to meet Ed, but I give thanks for him all the time. The reason that we were able to just start up with a remote worship is because of Ed's gift to the church of goading you all into it, from what I hear. As Bill Brown said, you did not say no to Ed Fischel. You could try, but it didn't do you any good. And Beth shared the story of how he started with the ministry by recording the services when her mother could no longer attend and going to her home and showing her the video of the service and that birthed a ministry that continues to this day. And his family was thrilled to learn that someone had given a camera and a microphone in his memory to continue that work. That's abiding in God's love. That's staying connected to the source. And you know what they did when they got to their new home in Oregon? They found another church. Not because they don't love you at Epworth. They loved you just as much as they ever had. But because they know that they have to continue to be connected. It's sort of hard to talk about connection, especially on a communion Sunday when some of you are going to be communing at home and some of you are going to be communing 
in the parking lot. Some of you are commuting in your cars. And I was sharing with our young pastor the other day that we doubt that we will ever be able again in our lifetime, possibly, to put bread in someone's hand to share the body and blood of Christ with them. But we are still connected. We're connected through our love. We're connected through our service. We're connected. If we, as long as we abide in Christ, we will abide with one another. We will continue to be together as best we can. We've got to cleave to each other. Wilt thou cleave thee only unto her as long as you both shall live? What that means is will you stay faithful? Will you stay together? Will this be the person that you share your life with until you have no more life to give? That is what we're called to do when we're called to abide with God, to abide in love. And that means standing up to injustice. It means standing up against racism. The other day I saw on the news the number of cases of violence against Asian Americans is up something like 400% in the last year. We can't tolerate that. That's not saying that we're doing these things, but we can't tolerate those things in the name of Jesus Christ. We have to say no in his name. We have to show love to everyone. And that was another thing I learned about Ed Fischel. He was an advocate for everybody, everybody, because no one was beyond the love of God in his eyes. I was so glad to hear the people share about him yesterday. And he's not the only person in this congregation who does those things. We celebrated his life. But I hope when we all get to the end of our lives that people will be able to say about us, we were someone who abided in love. We were someone who cleaved to God in Christ. We were folks who cleaved to the congregation, to one another. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we have continued to reach out in concern and love and service to the world in his name. We have to love each other. That's what Jesus said also that night before he died to his disciples. I'm giving you a new commandment. They all probably got out their quills and their papyrus to write it down or their rock to carve it in. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. They were ready to hear something earth-shaking and shattering. And what did he say to them? Love one another. They probably thought, Lord, we've known that for years. How many of you know that for years, that God wants you to love each other? That's a big duh, isn't it, Pastor Terry? That's a no-brainer. Until you try to do it. Until you try to do it. Because to love deeply is an act of will, not an act of feeling. So here we are this morning. We're going to share in communion remotely or distantly. Uh, mine so far hasn't blown away this time. I didn't get to take communion on Easter Sunday. I sort of faked it because mine blew away early on in the service. But however we can gather together, we are called to proclaim Jesus Christ who came that we might know love, who came that we might know pardon and peace, who came to empower us to be his presence in the world. We're coming up on the season of Pentecost now, the day of Pentecost. I hope we'll still be out here. I hope the cicadas won't have chased us either inside or back to our homes. But we will be here to celebrate, and we'll be here again to know that what happened so many years ago continues to happen. Greek has this lovely verb tense where things that have happened continue to happen. Resurrection continues to happen. The outpouring of the Spirit continues to happen. Abiding in Christ continues to happen. Abiding in his love. I am the vine, he said. You are the branches. And the fruit that you bear gives glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join now in singing our hymn of commitment, I Come with Joy to Meet.